Welcome to part two of our three-part series on protozoan diseases. So we're going to start off by looking at four protozoan diseases of the gastrointestinal tract. And so the digestive system, so intake through the oral cavity, form a bolus, you swallow the esophagus, stomach, that is all considered upper gastrointestinal tract. All protozoan diseases are lower gastrointestinal tract diseases. And so from the stomach, we have the small intestine. That's where all the nutrients are absorbed, including water. And then the large intestine, that is where water and then some electrolytes are absorbed. But the feces is formed in the large intestine. And the exit portal is the anus. So all of these diseases, they're all from the lower digestive system. These parasites are going to be in the intestine. They all cause diarrhea. There is a range of symptoms though. Some people are asymptomatic. Some people just feel a little nauseous. Some people vomit, some people don't. Some people have just diarrhea. And then some diseases like amoebic dysentery goes all the way to dysentery. So I've broken up the four diseases for you. There are three that cause chronic diarrhea, and chronic diarrhea is when diarrhea lasts for longer than 14 days, or acute diarrhea. And the definition of acute diarrhea, we learned acute infections, it has a sudden onset, and it usually ends quickly. But for diarrhea, acute diarrhea is three or more loose stools in a 24-hour period. That's what you would call acute diarrhea. The virulence factors that the protozoa have is that some of them, they just attach to the mucosa, so they change that functioning of the mucosa, either cause more secretions of fluid and electrolytes. Um, they can also hamper that absorption of nutrients. Some of them make lytic enzymes, so lytic means lice, so it's gonna damage cells. Some of them are invasive, so usually lytic and invasive go together. If you have invasion, Beneath the mucosa, that's when you get blood in the stool, and so that's called dysentery. So bloody stools, it's dysentery. So I forgot my animation. So acute, three loose stools within 24 hours. Chronic diarrhea is diarrhea that lasts longer than 14 days. The other things about protozoan diseases of the gastrointestinal tract, all of them are transmitted by what's called the fecal oral route. And that sounds exactly like what it's saying. So the exit portal is going to be the anus. So the cysts are going to leave or the infective stage can leave through the feces. And depending upon how that feces is handled, it could be then in contaminated water. Uh, sometimes sewage is used to grow crops, so it could be on food, but somehow it has to go from feces to the oral route in the mouth. This could also be due to poor hygiene. So that probably gave you a good picture of that. That was George Michael, by the way. The duration and the severity is gonna depend on the state of the host. A lot of these diseases are gonna be much more severe in immunocompromised hosts than, of course, also to the number of protozoa that are ingested. Treatment is gonna be oral rehydration therapy. When someone has diarrhea, they're losing excess fluids and electrolytes. Some of these are gonna be what are called self-limiting diseases, meaning nobody seeks treatment, meaning they're just gonna run their course. Other times, antimicrobial medications will be prescribed. These will not be antibiotics. They have to be drugs targeted to the protozoan. Prevention is gonna be good water hygiene. Whenever there is fecal contamination of a water source, that's when you get transmittance of these diseases. So water treatment chlorination, filtration, boiling. Also, personal hygiene is gonna stop that whole hand to mouth thing or my hand to your mouth thing. Also, proper food preparation and so cooking foods. The first disease we're gonna look at is giardiasis. And so this is a form of chronic diarrhea. And yes, there's differences in diarrhea. This diarrhea may have mucus and usually has a very strong odor. The causative agent is this guy so cute, Giardia lamblia. 
So they're pear-shaped. You're looking at the ventral surface and they have a sucker that they're gonna to use to attach to the intestinal wall. They have four pairs of flagella, but if you flip them over and look on the other side, they have two nuclei, they look like little eyes, and so you'll see pictures in lab. Here are the two forms. This is the trophozoite. Remember, those are the growing feeding forms. And then they are going to insist, and so this is one actually coming out of the cyst, so existation. So a single stool sample can contain 300 million cysts, Fun fact about this particular disease, it only takes 10. Yes, it only takes 10 to give you the disease. So infectious dose of 10. So very low infectious dose. Other things, that cyst stage, a lot of these um, are gonna be in the environment. And so this cyst is very hardy. This cyst can live for greater than two months in water, just in cold water outside, so. Trophozoite, active feeding stage, cyst stage, a hardy environmental survival structure dormant. So looking at the life cycles, normally this is going to occur through water, but it can also be through unwashed fruits and vegetables. And so the cysts are the infective stage because the cyst has that wall and it can make it through the acidity of the stomach. Then in the small intestine, these are going to, look, see they're all lashed onto the small intestine mucosa with those ventral suckers. And so then they're going to multiply. And then as they make their way to the large intestine, they're gonna insist. And then exiting out in the stool, you can have both the trophozoites and the cyst form, but it's just the cyst form that's gonna be that infective form. Like I said, those cysts, those are survival cells, very hardy. Uh, other distinctive things. So they're all gonna cause some sort of diarrhea. So I'll try to give you things and I've given you little pictures in your, or little icons in your study sheet to kind of help you remember which disease is which. So this is the number one identified, diagnosed parasitic infection in the United States. So there are one to two million cases per year. And most of the people, they're gonna get it through drinking contaminated fresh water. So hikers and campers. So they, did like, they don't watch Naked and Afraid, they don't know to boil their water or filter their water. This too can affect dogs. So dogs too, they'll uh, be throwing up, they'll have diarrhea, weight loss. So same signs and symptoms. It can also occur in daycare or healthcare situations where people are not using good Hygiene uh, can also have from sex, yes, oral anal contact, no judgment, just send something to watch for. And like that, so it's also the most common. So number one parasite in the United States, the disease is giardiasis caused by giardia lamblia, a flagellate. And so there, this is here for you. Just in case you don't have a textbook, I threw that in there. So our next one is amoebiasis, or if you just kind of remember, it's amoebic dysentery, because that is the only one that we're studying that causes dysentery. This is a form of chronic diarrhea with blood, that's what makes it dysentery, or pus in the feces. Usually there's going to be a fever present. So causative agent, entamoeba histolytica. So this word is giving you a hint and telling you how it can cause dysentery. So histo means tissue, lytic means death. So this organism, it makes lytic enzymes and it actually causes cells to go through apoptosis and then it can invade the mucosa. Other thing too, the cysts are chlorine resistant. It can be transferred person to person and they believe that 10% of the worldwide carries this amoeba in their intestine. This is the one that causes most deaths out of any of the other gastrointestinal protozoan diseases. And so it's mostly in infants and elderly and also the immunocompromised. In the United States, the people that you're gonna see that have these, it's high in the MSM population, men that have sex with men. You'll also see them in the immigrant poor. And so for a lot of these, they're gonna say domestically acquired 
were exotic, meaning somebody got them in another country. Amoebic dysentery is a bigger problem in developing countries that don't have water sewer treatment. And so it's common to pick it up elsewhere. So an exotic infection, as far as who you will see have it in the United States, men that have sex with men and the immigrant poor. So they came from one of those developing nations. So this is what it looks like. So these are, you can see the ulcers, these raised borders. But if you look at it longitudinally, so this is the histology, you see the microvilli, and then right here, that is a flath-shaped ulcer. And so that is a typical histology of amoebiasis, so amoebic dysentery. From this ulcer, then they smeared out, and then you can see those trophozoites of those amoeba. And so that is the active form. It's the only one that causes dysentery. Since it's capable of making these lytic enzymes, it can also penetrate that mucosa, get into blood vessels, and then circulate throughout the body and cause abscesses. And that word abscess, it just means a pus-filled region of swollen, inflamed tissue. And so this is showing one in the liver, but it can also travel and go to other organs, the brain and kidneys, and can cause death. So it is the number one cause of death from gastrointestinal protozoans. And so there that is for you. They spelled it wrong here. It's amoebiasis, so like an amoeba. And so that's there for you. And once again, good sanitation, personal hygiene is the best prevention. So our next one is cyclosporiasis. The causative agent is cyclospora chiatinesis. This causes chronic diarrhea. If someone seeks treatment, like I said, you're gonna have range of symptoms. There is no blood in the stool. This is not dysentery and the person will have a fever. What's different about this from giardiasis or amoebic dysentery, in this case, it's gonna be ingestion of oocysts. So this is a different reproductive stage. Also, there's going to be no person-to-person -person transmission because when these are released from the feces, they are not mature, so they are not capable of infecting anyone. What often happens is that the feces or water contaminated with these oocysts is often used to fertilize crops. And so this one is going to be transmitted usually by eating infected produce. So raspberries, herbs, greens. And so we have outbreaks in our country due to these herbs being grown in other countries where the protozoan is endemic. And then they use feces or fecal contaminated water to fertilize their crops. They get shipped to the United States and then either not washed, not cooked, then they are transferred to people. Also, too, even with washing, there's a very low infectious dose. So just an example of some of the outbreaks. 1996 to 1999, the, all of the raspberries coming from Guatemala were banned. That's because there was an outbreak. It affected about 1,500 people in the United States and in Canada, and they were all traced to raspberries from Guatemala. So the CDC sent people down to Guatemala, tried to find out what farm it was, and realize that it's pretty much endemic in the country and two to six percent of all raspberries tested were positive for cyclospora. Uh, also two more recently, you may remember this one in 2018, like all the prepared salad kind of got pulled off of the market rather suddenly. I believe cilantro was a part of this too. A lot of times there's gonna be recalls of greens when they are infected with cyclospora. And so just to kind of help you with your memory, because I always had to keep, you got to keep your cyclospora straight from your cryptococcus in a minute. I'm going to add cryptosporidiasis in a minute. So think cyclo, cyclists, they're healthy people. They like their produce. So maybe that can help you remember cyclosporiasis caused by cyclospora cayentinesis. And this is a non-modal apicomplexum.
of sporozoan. All right, so our last one is cryptosporidiosis, which we're just going to call crypto. Cryptosporidium is a microscopic parasite that lives in the intestines of infected humans and animals. It can be found in soil, food, water, or surfaces that have been contaminated with the feces from an infected host. Cryptosporidiosis is the name of the diarrheal disease caused by cryptosporidium. Both the disease and the parasite are commonly referred to as crypto. An infected person or animal sheds the parasites in their stool. In fact, millions of parasites can be released in a bowel movement from an infected human or animal. The parasite is protected by an outer shell that allows it to survive outside the body for long periods of time and makes it very resistant to chlorine-based disinfectants. Crypto can be spread by putting something in your mouth or accidentally swallowing something that has come into contact with waste infected with crypto. By swallowing recreational water contaminated with crypto. By swallowing contaminated water or beverages. By eating uncooked food contaminated with crypto. Or by touching your mouth with contaminated hands. People in buildings that have suffered from a sanitary sewer overflow or due to a flooding event should be aware of this parasite. Child care workers who change diapers and health care workers are also at risk. The most common symptoms of cryptosporidiosis is watery diarrhea. Other symptoms include stomach cramps or pain, dehydration, nausea, vomiting, fever, and weight loss. Some people with crypto will have no symptoms at all. While the small intestine is a site most commonly affected, Crypto infections could possibly affect other areas of the digestive tract or the respiratory tract. These are just a few things to know about cryptosporidium. Okay, so cryptosporidiasis, crypto. So this is acute diarrhea, so it's going to last less than 14 days. It's usually self-limiting, meaning someone's just going to empty themselves out and it does not require treatment. Although sometimes people can recover, but they will continue to shed oocysts for weeks after the symptoms subside. So fecal oral spread, and so the cysts are dormant. Uh, remember, they're resistant to harsh environments, and then the oocysts are part of that life cycle. The big thing with this one, and I gave you a picture of someone swimming or of water treatment, these oocysts, they can resist chlorination and sometimes because they're small, they can pass through filters, filtration systems. And so you will see outbreaks in swimming areas, so think pools or water parks, and also sometimes municipal water supply. It can also be transferred person to person. And like I said, people can continue to shed those oocysts for weeks after they recovered. So yeah, they've had some really big outbreaks. So in 1993, they had 403,000 cases just in Milwaukee, so just in one city. Yes, uh, so that's 25% of the population in Milwaukee. What happened, though, 69 people died, 93% were AIDS patients. So this is one of those things, if someone's immunocompromised, infants or elderly, they're going to have a high chance of dying from a gastrointestinal tract disease. This case, a uh, majority of those deaths were due to AIDS patients. Uh, in swimming pools, so recreational areas, swimming pools, about half of the outbreaks from pools are going to be all crypto. Cryptosporidiasis. Crypto is usually how it's referred because that is a mouthful. Also, since I don't want you to get confused between cryptococcosis, which was cryptococcal meningitis, I won't put those two on the same question because that'd be mean. So just kind of a refresher, we looked at Giardia lamblia, we looked at Entamoeba histolytica, both of those are shedding cysts. Both of those, that cyst is going to be in the water or in the environment. These O cysts, they too are going to be out into the environment for the cyclosporiasis, they are immature, so remember that's the one you can't get from someone else. You can only get from uh, eating produce or drinking infected water. In this case, in crypto's case, we're going to get the oocysts being shed, but they are ready to go. And so, like I said, usually it's going to be through contaminated municipal water supply or pool recreation areas. 
And so we're gonna get ingestion. Once again, it's gonna go into the intestine and cause that acute watery diarrhea. Here is the table from your textbook in case you would like to get more information. All right, so you have this in your notes. This is kind of what I want you to know. I have made a Quizlet for you. And so that's it. I'm going to wrap this one up. Come back for part three. You have an awesome day.